Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, conference on uh, systemic risk with uh, endogenous cycles. My name is Jean-Philippe Bonardi. I am the Dean of HEC Lausanne, which is the, the Faculty of uh, Business and Economics of the University of Lausanne. It's, uh, it's a great, great pleasure to have you here, and uh, also, of course, to have uh, you know, with us Rob Engel today, whom I will introduce in a minute. Um, as a dean, uh, I'm very, very happy you know, that we can hold this conference for at least three reasons. Uh, the first be is because one of the mission of what we do here, in fact, here across the campus, both here and at EPFL, is to try to promote uh, things that are the frontiers of what we know in terms of research, academia, and so on, which is certainly you know, one of the first part of our mission. But also, we try to push our professors to study topics which are you know, very relevant to try to understand and to try to uh, uh, address some of the problems that will be the problems of tomorrow, right? And certainly, you know, the conference that we have tonight um, addresses these two concerns, right? So it's a, uh, you know, we have, of course, you know, something uh, here that, uh, and a conference here that will be definitely at the top of the knowledge on, um, on these questions of the systemic risk uh, and uh, endogenous cycles, uh, but also something that is of great relevance. The question of a systematic ri systemic risk is certainly one that uh, constrains a lot, you know, policy making uh, in the context of crisis, so which is, you know, a real issue, but also, as we will see tonight, which can be the source and the cause, right, <laughs> of some of the problems. So it's a real conundrum, and it's great to have Rob here to try to <laughs> help us address it. So that's the first reason. The second reason why I'm very happy to you know, be here with you tonight and uh, that we can have this conference together is because it's a great opportunity to actually collaborate, right? Uh, so it's, uh, this conference is a collaboration between us at the University of Lausanne and EPFL, and uh, in particular, the Centre Interfacultaire Bernoulli, uh, which, is, uh, which is at EPFL. Uh, as a dean, we really try to foster and encourage this type of uh, collaborations. There is a lot of great things that are happening across the campus. And, uh, you know, sometimes putting people together, students, professors, and so on in the same room, uh, you know, is a great, great thing to do. So again, this is something that we try to encourage. And uh, uh, I thank you very, very much, all the people uh, who have been involved in actually, you know, um, uh, getting Rob here, but also in making this happen. So just let you know, <laughs> just a few that I, that I could name. You know, certainly Diane Perret from uh, from HEC Lausanne, and then uh, Nicolas Monod from uh, from EPFL and from the the Centre Interfacultaire Bernoulli, and uh, Luc Bowens, who is uh, actually running this um, this semesters this semester, which is um, focused on stochastic dynamic models in mathematical finance, econometrics, and actual science. So um, it's not exhaustive, but. <laughs> That's as good as I can do. <laughs> um, let me finish by saying that the third reason why I'm very, very happy to be here tonight with you is that uh, it's a fantastic honor and privilege to uh, welcome uh, Rem Rob uh, Engel here uh, with us tonight. Uh, I'm certainly not going to try, uh, Rob, to summarize your uh, fantastic career uh, in a few words. It would be... <laughs> Way too much of a task for me. Um, let me just say that uh, Rob is a professor of, uh, of finance uh, at New York University uh, Stern School of Business. That is uh, an expert and you know long term interested has been long term interested long, -term, long -term interested in time series analysis, especially you know focusing on macro macroeconomic issues and uh, you know financial markets and that he was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, in 2003 for probably many things, but you know, I guess that one of the things that people remember is this uh, research on uh, the concept of autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity, these arch you know, models. Uh, I will just stop there, <laughs> uh, up to the point where I'll reach my um, you know, level of uh, competence. Rob, again, this is a great, great opportunity to have you here. We're very, very happy, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening, all of you. It's great to see so many of you here. It's a great pleasure to be here. And let me just make sure, is this? Is it? Okay. Can you hear me all the way in the back? It's, it's a lovely room, and I'm uh, very pleased to be with you tonight. Um, 
it sounds like you've had a, a lot of interesting talks over the, the last, I guess, semester. And uh, I'm very pleased to be a participant here. Um, <laughs> um, I keep seeing new people in the audience that I didn't realize were here. This is great. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk tonight about some ideas in, uh, in the measurement and development of systemic risk that are um, related to the title that I've given, but I've actually changed it slightly. So this is maybe a little bit easier. Uh, how much S risk is too much? Or how much systemic risk is too much? And this, you might sort of think about this picture in that way. I mean, this is a, a volcano in, uh, in Chile where I was fortunate to be in, uh, in January. And well, it's very dormant, except that there's a little smoke coming out of the top. And if you look carefully, you sort of see that this is actually a chain of volcanoes. And are we sitting on one or not? And how do we know? And what is the relationship between this volcano and the financial system that we're, we are uh, going to talk about tonight? Do we have too much systemic risk or not? Um, so when we study systemic risk, it's very common to do stress tests of the financial sector and banks in particular. And um, when we uh, think about the purpose of these stress tests, it's typically to find out whether the bank has enough capital so that it can survive a downturn that is specified by the regulators, but is more or less designed to look like the last financial crisis. So this is a way of thinking about whether the financial institution has, is vulnerable to a shock. Uh, we can do it either regulatory way or, or I'm going to show you a, a, a non-invasive approach that we've been using for a long time. But I think more interesting question is whether when banks are undercapitalized, is there an inherent instability that comes from this that leads to the financial crisis? So it's not so much we're talking about an external shock that makes the banks collapse, but it's endogenous that the, the banks are unstable if they're um, undercapitalized. And that's what we want to explore today. And it's really, I think, kind of what we think really happened in the financial crisis is that the behavior of the banks in response to the, the high level of risk that they were undergoing actually created the crisis that we, that we live through. So it's very common to believe, or it's a common view, and I think more or less I agree with it, that excessive credit growth is really fundamental cause of the financial crisis. And this is, there's a lot of research on this. It has a lot of different names and, and exponents. Uh, it was popularized by Reinhardt and Rogoff in their book called This Time is Different. Uh, it's popularized by uh, Claudio Borio at the BIS and others who believe that we can see financial cycles kind of like business cycles. Uh, Adrian and Shin see leverage cycles. These are all related topics about what it means to have excessive credit growth. But the problem with measuring excessive credit growth is that how do you know whether it's excessive or not? When an economy is doing well, it's natural to have credit growth. You see businesses borrowing to make investments and households borrowing to buy houses. And this is all a good thing. 
So what do we mean by excessive? And, and uh, actually, a recent paper by uh, Schulrich and Taylor argue a particularly version of this, which is that a financial crisis is just a credit boom gone bust. That is, it is a credit boom, but it didn't turn out that well. And we have a financial crisis instead. How do we measure this? How do we take this to the data and see what uh, the difference between excessive credit growth and good credit growth really looks like? So credit is excessive, we might say, if it funds projects which have low net present discounted value. That is, maybe these projects, when you actually carry them out, will have a value which is less than the face value of them or the book value of them. In other words, these are projects which uh, really maybe shouldn't have been undertaken. So since a large fraction of, of aggregate credit is held as assets by the financial sector, this means that in a downturn, financial institutions who have lots of assets which are loans of this kind might be called on to use res capital reserves to cover the, turn, the declining value of their assets. So the capital reserves of banks are fundamental to whether we think that the, the, this, these uh, projects are actually excessive credit or merely uh, profitable credit. So when this market value credit falls below the book value, then the institutions may be called upon to support these investments with their capital reserves. So this leads us to talking about capital shortfalls of financial institutions. If the capital reserve is not sufficient to support the in assets in a downturn, then we have a capital shortfall for this financial institution, and that reflects the fact that the assets were uh, too uh, sensitive to output declines. Um, so this is leading us to a definition of what we mean by excessive credit growth. And we're going to use the notion of S-risk, which I've been talking about for quite a few years now, which is the answer to the following question. How much capital would a financial institution need to raise in order to function normally if we have another financial crisis? You'll see a lot of references here, a lot of people who have been involved in this. And this is the answer to how much capital a bank needs depends on how risky its assets are and how big the portfolio of assets really looks like. And it's a little bit like households. Households have some money in the bank, which they have because they might lose a job or have assets which go down in value. And households can ask themselves, what are the do I have enough savings so that I'm not going to have to go borrow money from somebody in the middle of a crisis? Well, that's the question that banks should be asking themselves, and regulators are certainly asking themselves about the banks. Do the banks have sufficient capital that they can survive a downturn? So this is a question of whether the banks have been making loans that are excessive. If they are making excessive loans and they don't have capital provisions for them, we would say that this is the, the measurable quantity that we're going to be interested in. So how do we define S-risk? Well, S-risk is uh, calculated as the capital shortfall conditional on a counterfactual, that is, that we have a crisis, we're going to use the median of this random variable conditional on the, on the, uh, the event that we have a crisis. And 
we're going to define it as looking at saying that there should be some relationship between the assets of a financial institution and its equity, and that relationship is summarized by a parameter k, which tells you what fraction of the assets should be held as equity. And if this amount of equity is less than that, then there's a capital shortfall. So what the econometric question is, is how do you actually estimate this number? Well, we do it in actually a, a both a simple and a complex way. Uh, the simple version of it is that for each firm we examine, which are financial firms all over the world, we look at the beta of its stock return relative to the global market return. But this beta is not exactly an ordinary beta. It's a beta that is allowed to change over time. And from this beta, we can calculate how much the value of the equity of this firm would go down if we have a collapse in the world's financial crisis, world's financial uh, uh, stock prices. So this decline in the, in the uh, global stock market is a stress. We put this stress on each bank and ask how much will its assets go down in value and how much therefore does its stock market value go down and uh, if it goes down so much that it no longer has this capital ratio, little k, that we've talked about, then it's going to need capital. And the S risk is a measure of how much capital would it need. OK? Simple? OK. Too simple? Maybe it's too simple. But anyway, it's, it's a very straightforward way to trying to assess whether there is a capital shortfall for such a financial institution. But how do we measure beta? Because beta is really this fundamental measure of both risk and interconnectedness of this bank with the whole rest of the economy. So it's important that we measure it well. We're going to use stock market data to measure it, but we're going to use techniques which many of you have, I've been told, studied in class, and that you're here tonight to know that they're actually useful. So let me tell you what it is. We're going to use a beta which changes every day. Every day the beta is different, and it's going to be estimated using what I call the dynamic conditional beta model, but I'm going to tell you actually what that is and how it works. What we do is we remember that the beta that we get in a re when we do a regression coefficient is nothing more than a correlation coefficient times the ratio of two standard deviations. Another way to say it is the covariance between the dependent variable and the independent variable divided by the variance of the independent variable. But in reality, all of these measures are changing over time. So to get a beta that's changing over time, we need a dynamic way of estimating volatilities and a dynamic way of estimating correlations. And this is, in fact, what my Nobel Prize was for, was for at least the early stages of how to estimate volatilities that are changing. And subsequently on how to measure correlations that are changing. If you know what this means, we use asymmetric models called the uh, Glossian, Jagannathan, and Runkle Garch models for both the volatilities of the market index and the volatility of the stock index, and a DCC model for the correlations. We put them together into a beta. But that's not the full story because Often we think betas ought to be constant. And it would be pretty hard to have this kind of a thing be constant because it's got three moving parts. And only by incredible coincidence could it be the same number every day for an entire sample period. So we, I, 
we do a test. And this happens to be a non-nested test because this is a non-nested hypothesis. And we do it by creating an artificial model which nests both the constant beta and the time varying beta model together. And this is the regression here. It says that the return on, on this firm's asset is some parameter phi times the return on the market. And that would be the only thing we would need if beta was constant. But if beta is time varying, we would use the one that we've already estimated times the market return. And we would expect theta to be equal to 1. And phi would be equal to 0. So the two extreme hypotheses are either that beta is constant and phi is equal to that value and theta is equal to 0, or beta is time varying, as our model says, and theta would be equal to 1 and phi would be equal to 0. So we run this regression every week for these 1,000 firms because we've estimated this model for 1,000 firms. And then we have to decide, are we going to choose between these two hypotheses? And what we've done is actually use the fitted values from this model, the estimated phi and the estimated theta and the estimated beta, and treat this as the beta. That is uh, an interesting solution because it's not treating either of these models as if it's the true model. It's letting the data pick between them. And it's a little bit like using shrinkage methods because it shrinks the, the time varying beta toward a constant beta, but not all the way. Typically, theta will be a little bit less than 1 and phi will be a little bit bigger than 0. So we get some combination between these, these two estimators of the beta. And that's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show it to you in a new way, however. I'm going to show you with a domestic index of returns rather than an international index of returns. And so this little picture uh, is about a domestic trip that I took when I was a kid. And that's actually me in the front there, uh, about to get into our uh, 52 Buick or whatever it was and drive across the country. And so I guess that's maybe the distance to a crisis or something like that. Uh, OK, so what's the difference? Well, <laughs> hard to believe, isn't it? Anyway, the, we're now going to use for the US, a US stock market series. For Belgium, we're going to use a Belgian stock market series. For France, it's going to be the CAC, and so forth. So a crisis is now defined as a collapse of the domestic stock market, not of the global stock market. And for that reason, it's hard to compare how risky one country is versus another because the stock markets have different volatilities to them. It might be one stock market would go down 40% in a crisis, another one would go down 50% in a crisis. How would you say one was greater than the other? That's the, just a feature of the data. Another feature is that we don't have to worry about currency Everything's done in the same currency. It's done domestic currency. And we don't have to worry about synchronicity of returns because the, it's all the same time zone. So there are a lot of simplifications that come from doing it this way. But there are also uh, some differences that we will want to follow. So we're going to ask, ultimately, how much would the domestic index have to fall to get S-risk up to a dangerous level. And that's what we're going to mean by the distance to a crisis. We're going to measure how much of a collapse in the Swiss stock market would, would it take to get the domestic S-risk number to be big enough so we would say this would be a self-fulfilling crisis. <laughs> 
So this is a little bit like a paper that I wrote with, uh, with Eric and Michael, which looked at domestic index, uh, global index, and a European index. But we're only going to use them one at a time. We're using the uh, global index when we do S risk. We're going to use the domestic index when we do the local index. So why aren't we using the others? Well, first of all, there's a lot of collinearity between these indices. So it's very hard to actually measure carefully the difference between them unless you make some assumptions about causal ordering or something like that, which is what I think effectively we did in the previous one. So by leaving the other one out, our local index is really a marginal analysis of what is the relationship between, between a Swiss bank and a Swiss stock market, letting the global stock market be whatever it wants. Uh, it's uh, highly, so, you know, we all know that with a multivariate analysis, if you leave out a variable, you're basically integrating out over the values of that missing variable, and that's essentially what is happening here. So we're getting domestic beta that we can interpret as a domestic beta without needing to put in the, uh, the global market. So here's what we see when we look at, uh, compare the, the S-risk betas and the with the global index and with the local index, the, the um, domestic beta is on the top and the global beta is on the bottom, and this is for Credit Suisse. So what do you see? Well, they don't look that different, although there's a little bit different response to the financial crisis in 2008, the domestic beta went up a little more than the international beta did in that case. If you look at uh, UBS, you see something sort of similar. If you look at uh, China, ICBC, you can see there's actually considerably more difference there. And that reflects the fact that the Chinese stock market is actually relatively insulated from the rest of the world. There's a lot, there's relatively low correlation between the Chinese market and the global market compared to what you would actually expect for a major economy like this. Um, here's Deutsche Bank um, and Commerce Bank, BNP, or in Europe, right? Here's a lot of European banks. Australia. Basically, as you can see, the difference between using the domestic beta and the international beta is not that great. There might be some differences, one case or another, but it's actually not, not a big difference. But it does enable us to ask this distance to crisis question in a more coherent way. We don't have to talk about the global distance to crisis. We can talk about the domestic because that's where this, uh, this endogenous cycle was going to come from. So the regulatory challenge is that the answer to this question, how much capital would you have to raise if there's a financial crisis, is clear from a regulator's point of view. That is, you, the regulator would hope that the answer would always be zero. How much capital do you have to raise if we have another financial crisis? If the answer is zero, then that's good news. If it's a big number, that's bad news because the bank is going to come to the taxpayers and say, can you, can you lend me a dime? Can you, or a billion? Uh, so what should regulators do if the answer is the bad news answer is bigger than zero? Well, regulators have a variety of choices. They can uh, require compliance by some time period, by threatening something. They can apply a tax or a penalty. They can uh, restrict policy options, such as paying dividends, and they or they could supply the capital that's needed directly. 
So almost most of these options are going to require the firms to raise capital after a negative shock, which is typically a hard time to do it. You'd like to raise capital in good times, not in bad times, because in bad times, it's hard to do. And if, if the total DS risk is very large, it might be very hard to do. So this is the regulatory dilemma. <laughs> Are we solving the next crisis or the last crisis? We hope we're doing both, but we need to be cognizant of this problem. So let me come back to the question that I started with. Why is high de-risk dangerous? Well, first of all, because the financial sector is apparently fragile. But second of all, because high de-risk leads to deleveraging. That is, banks are going to have to reduce their leverage, they're going to have to reduce their risk, and it is this deleveraging that we're going to turn to to discuss how a cycle endogenously creates the, how deleveraging endogenously creates the cycle. And if some value of de-risk is sufficient to create a crisis, then we can compute what decline in the domestic equity market would produce this crisis, and that's what we've called a distance to crisis. So how do firms reduce their leverage or reduce their uh, de-risk? Well, first of all, if, this, if de-risk is high compared to GDP, for example, then that means that the regulators ought to be a little frightened because they might have to produce a fair fraction of GDP in order to recapitalize the banks. If de-risk is large compared to the market cap, then firms are going to be unwilling to sell new shares of stock. That is, if their stock valuation is, all, is already low and they're going to need to increase it by 50% or 100%, then if they start to sell that many shares of stock, it's going to drive down the price of the stock, and that will make old investors as well as the company unhappy. But really, the third choice is not so great either. If it's a large fraction of total assets, then that means a lot of assets will have to be sold and to sell this many assets, it's going to lower the price of the assets. And this is what we call the fire sale externality. And it may be very costly to firms to deleverage in this way. So I'm going to look at these three different measures because they have different incentives for the financial institutions and for the regulators. So let's look, first of all, at, at um, the last one, which is selling assets. So if firms have high S risk or, or DS risk and decide that they have to reduce their leverage, which would be potentially because the regulator tells them to, or possibly because the risk manager tells them to, that this is a dangerous situation, then they have this choice between selling stock or selling assets. If they sell assets, this is what starts the leverage spiral. Because they, there are quite a few models that build this kind of leverage cycle. And I'm just going to sketch what they look like. I'm, this is uh, basically a version in uh, Kant and Shanning. But uh, Greenwood and all have a, a similar sort of model. So, how much asset sales is really required to get rid of the S risk? Well, it turns out if you set S risk equal to zero in the little equation I gave you and solve for how much you would need to sell, you need to sell S risk divided by K. That is the total dollars that would be needed divided by the regulatory or the prudential capital requirement 
that we've used in calculating S-risk. Furthermore, one firm would have to do this, but in fact, all the firms with positive S-risk would have to do this. And if this is a large number of assets that need to be sold, a large fraction, then this is going to drive the price down and we're going to have substantial price impact. So the models that I described treat this as a network problem where each firm sells its assets and then realizes that they didn't get as much money for them as they expected. And so then there's the next round where they sell assets again to make up the difference. And well, then there might be another round and so forth till it eventually converges or spirals to, uh, to bankruptcy. I think what's missing in that analysis is what equity investors are thinking at this time. Equity investors who see that their bank is going to have to delever it and that all these other banks are going to too must recognize that their equity values are going to go down. And so a natural implication of this is that the equity prices are likely to fall immediately long before the deleveraging is maybe even started, let alone completed. So as soon as it turns out that a bank or an economy needs to have its banking sector delever, you see financial prices falling right away. And these lower prices actually predict the deleveraging, but it's, it's the causality actually goes the other direction, but the timing is that the uh, equity market goes first. So here's the, a typical picture. You, you sell assets to retire debt. The asset values fall from the price impact. Equity valuations fall as a result of selling assets for less than their book value. And then S-risk declines, but not as much as anticipated. So you go around this thing a few times until either somebody rescues you or you come to an equilibrium or you fail. And while this is happening, the real economy is struggling because the banks are not lending, making new loans since they're trying to sell their old loans. There is a credit squeeze that the real economy is going to feel and the stock market is going to go down as a result and as well as a result of the financial sector going down. So how much leveraging, deleveraging is really possible? Well, if too many assets must be sold, this spiral is going to end in default. And we can uh, take a look at actually how big the sales have to be relative to the existing stock of assets as a way of measuring whether this is a really a big problem or a small problem. That is, if we look at the total of S risks, we divide it by K to tell us how much asset sales are really needed. And then we look at what the total assets are. If that's a big fraction of total assets, we can see that this is a big problem. Well, let's take a look at what those numbers look like. Can you see that? This is a picture of, in the, right now, of what the S risk is compared to GDP, oh, compared to GDP, first of all. So this is a question of how scared the regulators should be. And the most terrified regulators are probably in Japan, where it looks like it would be 13% of GDP would be needed to pay off the banks. Well, I think the regulators in Japan are very worried. And uh, I think there's a big issue in Japan. But right behind is France. And so France, it looks like 12% of GDP. The banks are quite undercapitalized in France. And it, if the, uh, this process were to happen, it looks like it would cost 
a very substantial chunk of GDP. And then it goes down the list, Canada, UK, Switzerland, Switzerland, okay, that's just under 8%. I don't think anybody wants to spend 8% of GDP rescuing the banks. And I think especially not, not here where the view is that the banks are serving the rest of the world, not Swiss uh, customers, or at least the, the bulk of them. Well, what about market cap? The S risk divided by the market cap is a second measure that we talked about. This is how easy is it going to be for banks to raise capital by selling shares? Well, if you're Cyprus, you're going to have to sell 120% of the equity that you've already got. So you've got stock valuations added up for the whole financial sector, and then you've got needs to recapitalize this bank, all, all the banks in Cyprus, that are more than 100% of what you've already got. The chances of that being successful are zero. Cyprus is not going to be able to sell shares to uh, recapitalize its banks. But you come, and then here's Greece second, well that's only a 75% Korea, but look, here's Germany, and 45%. So Deutsche Bank has been raising capital. Uh, they seem to be able to. I don't know whether they've raised enough capital to get their S risk to zero. Uh, according to our numbers, they haven't. Um, but this goes on down the list here. And now the third measure is S risk over total assets. And so this is the question of whether if you try to delever by selling assets, whether you're going to risk a fire sale. And the bigger this percentage, the more likely it is that you're going to have a fire sale. So here we see Japan on the top again at more than 5% of assets. And since the capital ratio is 8%, this means almost half the assets Japan would have to sell. Korea, Brazil, here's France again, coming in at a little over 3.5%. But because France is using IFRS accounting, we're using a lower level of case of only 5.5%. So it also has, would have to sell about half its assets the banks would have to sell about half their assets. This is a really major requirement of selling and is why it's very hard for banks to delever this quickly. So here's some time series pictures of some of these things. This is for the United States and we have S risk over GDP, S risk over the market value and S risk over total assets and now I've divided it by K so that that is interpreted as the assets for sale divided by the total assets. And the uh, GDP number is on the right axis, the others are on the left axis. And so if you look at the peak of the financial crisis, in the US it looked like it was about 6% of GDP was needed to recapitalize the banks. If you look at the market cap figure, it looks like it would be about, we needed to raise about 80% of the market cap at the peak, which would be very hard to do, and one of the reasons why the Fed uh, recapitalized the banks. If you look at the, uh, the assets as a, for sale as a share of assets, total assets, it's about 50%, which means that the banks, again, would have had a hard time selling at that point in time. Okay. Well, here are just a few more countries. Here's Brazil. Um, you can see in this period, the, uh, the green and the red are higher than the blue, but then the blue gets to be higher, the GDP figure, so the GDP has not grown as fast as the, uh, the uh, S risk has. Um, and there was a period in here where it looked like the things were going great for Brazil, but not today. <laughs>
Here is France. And we have actually a data issue here which hasn't been solved yet, but will be. Um, and you see here 12% of GDP, that's what we, that's the point we ended with. About, um, let's see, well, I don't, it's hard to read that end from over here, but it's about 5% of, 50% uh, of uh, total assets would have to be sold in France. Um, here is Switzerland. Here, UK. And UK, as you can see, is today maybe 8% of GDP, but it was only a few months ago, it was more like 12 or 15% of GDP. Okay, so how are we going to use this? So what we want to do is we want to look and see when we've had a crisis, what were these indices look like for different countries, which different crises. So I'm going to use a data set that Romer and Romer have, have put together. What, sorry, I've forgotten what time did I, uh, I'm supposed to be done, what, five minutes? Pretty soon? Okay. I think I better speed up. So put together a, uh, a data set on what, how big, how serious was the crisis in 24 different countries during this sample period? And they did it by looking at the OEC, OECD uh, report, semi-annual reports and looking at the words that were used to describe the financial crisis and came up with a number between zero and 15 for each half year for each country. Um, so what I want to know is, would some of these indicators that we've just been looking at predict that a country was in a crisis or not? And so I'm going to use for these 24 countries, actually only 23 it turns out, but countries, I'm going to look at the dependent variable is this measure of how severe a crisis was at a particular half year and look at how that is predicted by the S risk divided by GDP, for example. So this is what the crisis indicator looks like for these 24 countries, all plotted on top of each other. And you see most of them go up at the same time, but you know, the, uh, the post-crisis period looks quite different across countries, and some of them have crises in the early 2000s as well. Here is the data on S risk over GDP for the same 24 countries. Here is S risk over total assets. And here is S risk over the market cap. So, oh, and here's leverage too. And you can see that shows very dramatically the effect of the financial crisis. So here's a little regression running this measure of crisis severity on uh, S-risk divided by total assets, S-risk divided by GDP, and S-risk divided by uh, market cap. And basically, the GDP variable comes in with the wrong sign, but the other two are both significant. We have certainly evidence that the contemporaneous effect between S-risk and total assets and S risk and market value seems to be a significant explanatory variable. We've included both cross-section and time period dummy variables, so this peak in the crisis is actually already included as, as dummy variables, so we're asking whether there's an improvement from looking at, at these S risk measures over what you get just for the, the dummy variables. R squared is 62%. Uh, not overwhelming, but actually uh, encouraging. Um, if you lag all these variables and you put in a lag dependent variable as well, you'll see you still get significance from the S risk over assets. Uh, GDP still has a negative coefficient and the market value drops slightly uh, out of, out of the, uh, the magic 5% uh, p value. Um, and if you 
construct a leverage variable, which is really the ratio of S risk over market value divided by S risk over uh, total assets, you can see that you get effect from the leverage as well as effect from uh, total assets. So this is probably the nicest specification. It suggests both the leverage effect and an effect from this ratio of S risk to total assets. So the idea is that this equation or something like this equation could predict a crisis might tell us how close we are to having a crisis. So what we're going to do is use the best variable from these models, which was the total assets divided by, um, sorry, S risk divided by total assets. Since that, um, there are some, those data errors affected the market value. I, I can't really do this calculation at the end of the sample for the equation that I just estimated, so I'm just going to use the one indicator. Uh, I'm going to look at the 90th percentile of this uh, measure and say, okay, what would it take in terms of a domestic collapse to get to 90th percentile point on the share of total assets that need to be sold? So the 90 percentile point is um, 0.54, which is just over half the assets. So if you have to, if getting S risk to zero requires selling a little more than half the total assets of the financial sector, we're either in a crisis or really close to it. Okay, so we've done this with S risk at a 40% level, but it might only take a 20% level to get to this point, or it might take a 60% level to get to this point. The question is, what kind of return does it take on the domestic index to get us to needing to sell half the assets, which we think would be too much? So here's what the picture looks like for Switzerland. If we stress the Swiss market by 10%, it produces basically 20 billion of S risk or DS risk. If we stress it by 20% down, then we get a 25% and so forth, all the way up to 99% drop in the, uh, the SMI would correspond to a collapse of a need for $150 billion for the financial sector in Switzerland. So where do we lie on this curve? That's the question that we're trying to ask. Where do we lie on this curve? It turns out 75% is the magic number. By calculating what the uh, current S risk is for Switzerland and what it would take to get it up to, to get to the 5.5%, 5.4% here, I can see where on this graph we have to be, and it's about here. It was about something like 100 billion of S risk would be the, uh, the number that we would say would be in crisis. So if the Swiss economy, Swiss stock market falls by 75%, a crisis is probably upon us. Well, what about the others? For the US, it actually is even higher than that, which is, I think, a testament to a lot of the deleveraging that the banks have already done in response to the Dodd-Frank Act. In France, the distance to crisis is 28%, which means it's a lot closer. The stock market would only have to go down 28% in order to get France's S risk or DS risk up to this particular level. And for Japan, which is even worse shape, we have 22%. None of them does, is at zero, but I guess they're not really in a financial crisis at this point in time. So we think they just have some distance to go, but they're not exactly there. So um, that's the measure that I'm thinking 
is an interesting measure to look at. How much of a collapse would it take in the financial sector to get to this point? Um, I have a few more slides which are kind of what do we see globally about risk? Where is the risk? This picture actually is useful for that. Where is the risk? I mean, my wife is sitting here in the second row, and this is her pink hat. <laughs> this is also in, in Chile. And this is me, that's my son, that's my daughter-in-law. And this is the guy that is about to, has two seconds left before we're, we've got this, the risk. <laughs> we're very close to it. Um, so here's the world's picture of where the risk is. So we can see the financial crisis here, the European sovereign debt crisis here, another little hump here that's not been named yet. I think it's China, but I heard today maybe it's really Europe, and some improvement sort of toward the end. Total amount, $3 trillion. That's a lot, but that's recapitalizing the entire world. Um, as you see, where is the world's S risk? China is the top and Japan is the second. US is third. So let's take a look. Here's what's happening in the US. It's been coming down. It came down pretty dramatically after the election. It's now started up a little bit. I have one slide on that. Europe risk is actually coming down after a couple of elections, but it went up after the one last summer, the, the Brexit vote. Um, China risk is kind of a big worry. It's increasing very rapidly. It doesn't look at all like either the European or the, the US or the North American. But of course, many people ask, does this model really apply to China with state-owned banks and all that? The banks are not going to fail. And I think the answer is yes, it does apply to China. Exactly for that reason. Because the banks cannot fail, they are surely too big to fail. They have no reason to economize on risk. They're doing a bad job of allocating capital because they're allocating capital to state-owned enterprises that are in disarray and not, not doing well and can't repay their loans, so they make new loans to the same ones. So that the banks are not doing their, their job uh, effectively in China. The government guarantees everywhere. Most of the, the bonds are state-owned enterprises and so that, or local governments, and they're all guaranteed. So Basically, the summary is, I think the model does apply to China. It doesn't include shadow banking, which is an enormous sector in China and would only make the numbers bigger. But in fact, we don't expect to see a run on the banks or a collapse the way we did in the US. I think we're much more likely to see stagnation in China. And I think that's the thing to pay attention to. Uh, is the Chinese economy really going to strengthen again, or is this a gradual decline that we're going to see more and more of? This is my picture for China. And in case you can't tell what it is, it's pretty amazing, enormous sculpture in, uh, in uh, upstate New York. So here's my one slide on deregulation. We've talked about regulation, we've talked about spirals, but we can have, we can have spirals in the other direction. We have seen, thinking about this, President Trump has proposed deregulating the financial sector He's actually made some steps toward this, although certainly has not come close to getting Congress to agree to what he wants to have done. Um, it could happen. I think the banks feel like this would be very nice. 
they would like to be deregulated. Uh, many of the rest of us are not so sure that's a good idea. The regulation has been pretty effective in a lot of ways, although it's not perfect. Um, so what do we think it looks like when you deregulate a bank? What are the incentives on the banks? Well, if you deregulate them, then these banks can buy risky assets and borrow money so that they can increase their balance sheet and leverage up. So I have a, a very good student, uh, uh, Ruan, who calls this the race to the top. So if banks have suddenly more room to expand their balance sheet and they start buying assets, there's going to be a price impact in the upward direction, just like we have a price impact in the downward direction. This is going to increase their revenues. And the stock market view on this is again going to be, this is good. We are going to increase the valuation of these banks even before they start their leveraging up. And so you see high market valuations of the banks apparently improved financial structure, which was shown on this, on this graph, as a result of increasing the, the ability for banks to take on more risky assets. Now, in case you think we just made this up, this is actually a story that applies before the financial crisis like it does now. We had relatively lax regulation before the financial crisis, and banks were desperate to increase their risks. They wanted to increase revenues. The regulators were allowing this. And if you think about some of the acquisitions that were done in this period, like Countrywide was bought by uh, Bank of America, and uh, Golden West was bought by Wachovia. Remember Wachovia? Both of these transactions occurred in, actually were finalized in the spring of 2008. So this is way after the banks had their high valuations. And so we see this same story that I told about the spiral going in the down direction in the spiral going in the up direction. What is the implication of this? Well, the implication is that banks currently have higher capital because of the stock market valuation. They have incentives to increase their risks. And if the deregulation really happens, they can carry it, they can carry it out and increase their leverage and their risk profile. Thus, they are safer in the short run and riskier in the long run. So we're, we're offering them a deal of good news for us in the short run, bad news in the long run. And this is actually what I hope the debate will be when it comes to Congress and people have to decide what to do. Because we are all concerned about the distant future, not just the near-term future. These are uh, two of my grandsons wondering what's going to be out there. So thank you. <laughs>